Good morning. morning. Thanks. This morning's gospel reading is from the 17th chapter of the book of Luke. As you may or may not know, the way we break up Bible readings with verses and chapters is a much later addition to the text. It is superimposed onto the original translations for ease of reference. The original manuscripts are not broken up as such, nor, as you can probably surmise, are there those individual titles for each chapter that you find in some translations. Nonetheless, the title of this chapter is Some Sayings of Jesus. And although they do relate to one another, it wouldn't be all that disingenuous to pluck one out without much background. So, that is exactly what we'll do this morning. The book of Luke, chapter 17, verses 5 through 10, the author writes, The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord replied, If you had faith, the size of a mere mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, Put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink. Later, you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Here ends this morning's reading. Thanks be to God for these words of life. Before I begin, I do want to clarify that the use of the Billy Sunday quote at the beginning is not a general endorsement of his theology. If you know anything about him, we agree on some things, but we also don't agree on a lot of other things. So take it with a grain of salt. As Catherine noted, this is often heard, this passage this morning is often heard without much context. And I wanted all of you to hear it that way first. And although this passage is self-contained, I can't help it and start with a, just a little bit of context. Immediately preceding this morning's reading, Jesus is emphasizing the importance of forgiveness within the community, which then sets up today's reading. He says, if a brother or sister sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. So it appears to me that the old saying, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, is not biblically based. A biblically based version might sound something like, fool me once, shame on you, unless you apologize, and then we're cool. Fool me seven times in one day, and we're still cool as long as you don't commit to doing it again. Now, I don't know about you, but if one person, the same person, sinned against me seven times in one day, I'm not sure I could do it. I guess it does kind of depend on the sin, though, right? If I had to wait in seven different lines in one day and the same person cut in front of me every time, I probably would get annoyed, but I wouldn't care that much. However, if you stole my cookies and then my fruit snacks and then my ice cream, that's grounds for an altercation. And we're not even halfway to seven desserts yet. But in all seriousness, it would be difficult to be that forgiving if called upon. And naturally, the disciples respond to this big ask by saying, increase our faith. There's no way that we can do this. Help us. 
And Jesus' reply is actually often misunderstood. I don't read biblical Greek. Mike does. I do not. Mike read biblical Greek in seminary. I read Korean women's theology. You only have three years. There's only so much you can do. But from what I've read about biblical Greek, there are basically two kinds of if clauses. The first expresses a condition contrary to the fact. So an example would be, if I were you, I would definitely text her back. I'm not you. We all know this. The other kind of if clause references a condition according to a fact. So an example of this would be, you know if I'm alive and breathing, I'll be at that party. The assumption here is whenever this party occurs, I will still be alive and breathing. Thus, my presence at the party can be assumed. Jesus' response to the disciples' plea to increase their faith is actually an example of the latter. So perhaps a clear way to translate this could be, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, which you all obviously do, then you could say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. I always read this the other way, as Jesus kind of shaming the disciples. But he's actually giving them a bit of a pep talk, in a way. He's reminding them that they follow a God for whom all things are possible. And so words like absurd or impossible or outrageous don't exist in God's lexicon. Through faith, there is no limit to that which can be accomplished. Which brings us to the second part of the reading this morning, which is what I really want to focus on. Because although Jesus is pumping the disciples up, so to speak, in verses 5 and 6, he reminds them in verses 7 through 10 to stay off their high horses. Verse 7 starts, Who among you? Which is a common opening in Luke, actually. Jesus uses it or something similar to it quite a few times. Pro tip, when this question is asked, the answer is always no one. Who among you? would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table. So if you're anything like me, you hear the word slave, and this passage all of a sudden becomes very uncomfortable. The master-slave relationship in the ancient world was one that the original audience would be quite familiar with. And although it clearly wasn't an empowering model of human interaction, it also wasn't at nearly as evil as the racially based and profoundly abhorrent chattel slavery in the United States. So unfortunately, Americans have different associations with this kind of relationship between two people because of our nation's history. And that can interfere with our ability to grasp what Jesus is really talking about. I'll start at the beginning of verse 7, and then we'll continue on. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me? Put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink. Later, you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, Say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The slave has to do double duty here. He's working out in the field, and then when he's done, he's got duties in the kitchen to take care of before he can eat. And although our modern ears may struggle to hear it, there is no need for the master to thank the slave. The slave is expected to do what is commanded of him. That's just how it works when you're in that position. Your time and your labor aren't really yours. They are someone else's. Now, again, I'm not, I want to emphasize I'm not in favor of this arrangement, but I do need to name it in order for us to understand this passage. What Jesus is doing is inviting us to see ourselves as the slave in this example, and God 
as the master. Unfortunately, there isn't really a one-to-one -one analogy in the present day for this. So I'll try to give a few different examples that might help us understand how we can think of this passage as it applies to us today. The first has to do with Camp Highlands, the summer camp I attended as a boy and young man. For the oldest campers, ages 14 to 16, there is an award given out called Honor Tripper. In order to receive this award, to become an Honor Tripper, you have to best exemplify the good or best camper qualities, particularly on your camping trip, which is often the most demanding and challenging time of the camp experience. Traits that are particularly highly valued are perseverance, initiative, and camp spirit, which is essentially having a good attitude and supporting others around you when the going gets tough. I wanted this award, badly. You get your name painted on a canoe paddle along with everyone else who won it that year. And that paddle is then placed on the wall of the dining hall for everyone to see for years to come. All the way back, I think they started it in 1970. I can remember asking one of the older guys about the specifics. Yeah, I know it's the best camper qualities, but what does this look like concretely? What does this look like in practice? His response? You're going to be hiking all day, 15 to 20 miles, along with some elevation change. You're going to be dirty, you're going to be hungry, you're going to be exhausted. And when you get to the campsite at the end of the day, everything in your mind and body will be telling you to drop your pack, sit down, and rest. Do not do that. To get your name on the paddle, you need to immediately start helping set up the campsite. Set up the tent if you've got it. Start organizing the cook kit and ingredients for dinner. Gather firewood, pump or iodine more water, volunteer to cook dinner and clean the dishes. Whatever needs to be done, do it, preferably without being asked. That conversation was the first thing that came to my mind when I read this story, because I remember how hard it was to work all day and then do double duty. <clears throat> if you're a parent, I imagine you can identify with this story, particularly if you're a single working parent. If you're the primary caregiver of a friend or family member, you might know this feeling. The feeling of working all day and then coming home and not getting a reliever. Now, the major difference between my story and the Bible story is that I was specifically doing all of these things to get my name on a paddle, <laughs> to get recognition. <clears throat> now, this might be a long shot, but how many are you, of you are familiar with the phrase, what, do you want a cookie? Ah, a few. It's primarily used on the internet. It is occasionally used IRL, but it is mostly an internet culture thing. And it is a sarcastic response when someone is seeking praise for something that is rather unimpressive. It's akin to, so do you want a medal? Do you want a ribbon, a gold star? An example might be if we were having a discussion about global climate change, and I said, oh yeah, for sure, I'm super committed to the cause. You know guys, I held on to this glass bottle like all day yesterday until I finally found a recycling bin. Huge pain, but totally worth it. The proper response to that would be, so do you want a cookie? <laughs> and when I was 16 and trying to get my name on that paddle, that paddle was, in a way, a glorified cookie. Now, was it an extremely effective motivator to help me learn how to and then act like the best person I could be? Absolutely, of course it was. And there is nothing inherently wrong with that. Jesus, however, is saying, no, no, no. That's not why we serve others. We don't serve others to be lauded or celebrated. We serve others because that's what we do. God has commanded us to do it, so we do it. It's who we are. It's much more akin to being on staff 
at a summer camp and leading 10 and 11 year olds on a camping trip. As the counselor, I'm doing all that stuff anyway. I'm setting up the tent, I'm cooking the meals, I'm washing the dishes. And I'm not expecting the kids to be super grateful because they're little kids, it's my job to do that. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The way I read it is this is actually a call away from a transactional view of our interactions with others and a call for a focus only on the service itself. I feel like this plays out in our lives in a bunch of different ways. Now, this might ruffle some feathers, so stay with me. This is how I feel about thank you notes. If I give someone a gift, say I gave Stephen a gift, doesn't matter what it's for, Christmas, birthday, wedding, whatever, whatever. If I expect a thank you note from Stephen in return, then that's not really a gift giving occasion anymore. That becomes a transaction. I gave you this thing, and now you owe me something else. The thank you note, if, and this is the big if, if it is expected and assumed, then it just becomes a different form of payment. Now, of course, not all thank you notes do this, right? If I'm not expecting a thank you note from Stephen, and yet he writes one anyway, simply because he feels moved to do so, that's great, that's awesome. In this scenario, the service is in the giving of the gift. It is done not for recognition. It is not done so that I no longer have to give this person gifts anymore, nor for thanks. The gift is given because I felt like it was the right thing to do. I wanted to do it. God has commanded me to love my neighbor, and this gift is an expression of my love for my neighbor. It was commanded, I do it. There is no need for gratitude, because that's missing the point. To use the biblical analogy, the slave does not expect a thank you note. Thus, nor should I. I only have done what I ought to have done. What this passage really can be boiled down to is doing the right thing, not because everyone is looking, but doing the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Whether people are looking or not is really of no consequence. And in fact, it's probably better if folks aren't looking. That is the call of discipleship. Jesus lived a life of service to others. And through this little anecdote, he is reminding us that we too are called to live a life of service to others. And there is no point in which we can sit back and say, I've done enough. Now it is time for others to serve me. Even after years and years of faithful service, no one can earn themselves a position from which they can boast from. I was also reminded of a story that Howard Thurman tells, and I looked and I looked, and for the life of me, I could not find it word for word. But it goes something like this. Thurman was visiting a parishioner, an older woman in the hospital. Death wasn't imminent, but it also wasn't out of the question. And she was in quite a bit of pain. She turns to him and says, you know, I've been praying a lot recently. And Jesus actually came to visit me. Really? Thurman responds. And what did he say? The woman replied, so I'm sitting here by myself. I can't go anywhere. I can't get out of bed. I'm in physical and emotional pain. And Jesus has the gall, the audacity to come in here and tell me that I should single-handedly fund the church's soup kitchen ministry. Other people should be taking care of me, you know, not me taking care of other people. Thurman thinks about this and asks, 
Is that what you told Jesus? Well, yes, in so many words. And what did Jesus say? Well, from what I can tell, he wasn't having any of it. And I mean, he knew I was going to do it whether I wanted to or not. But then, as he left, he said to me, what did you think you were getting into when you got baptized? She decided to do double duty, to endure her own suffering and yet transform it into a path toward the alleviation of suffering for others. This is what we get into when we get baptized. We get ourselves into a life of service. And not only a life of service, but a life of service that does not demand or expect gratitude or recognition. A life of service without thank you notes, without memorial plaques, without philanthropy awards, without the expectation of reciprocation. And that, I feel, is one of the most difficult pieces of both the life of discipleship and a life of kindness, our fall theme. When we choose to be kind, to be sincerely invested in the bettering of the lives of others, and that kindness is ignored, or worse, rejected, it is extremely difficult to extend the hand again. It is extremely difficult to exercise empathy for those for whom you suspect the same courtesy will not be granted. It is extremely difficult to suffer and then not pass that suffering on to others. It isn't easy to be constantly bombarded with negativity through social media and news outlets, and yet still be profoundly committed to treating every person we encounter as if they too are made in the image of God, because as it turns out, they are. None of this stuff is easy. And even if we are successful, even if we can find a way to forgive seven times in a day, Jesus reminds us that it is not our place to boast about this. It's not about the cookie. There's no such thing as disciple of the year or union church member of the year. And there's a reason for that. That's not why we do this. You may be asking yourself, or perhaps you are now asking me, so what's the good news then, Grant? How is not getting the cookie good news? The good news is that the more you let the cookie go, the less it matters to you. Awards don't matter because that's not why you serve. Thank you notes don't matter because that's not why you gave the gift anyway. Our society's definitions of success fall by the wayside as we sharpen our focus on service. Sure, there are no winners, but that also means there aren't any losers either. In fact, we seek out those whom the world has deemed less than and actively widen the circle of compassion and embrace them. The race to have the biggest house, the nicest car, the most successful child, that race doesn't matter anymore. I no longer need that to feel validated. I no longer need it to feel whole. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the sound of my pleadings. The Lord is my strength and my shield, in him my heart trusts. So I am helped and my heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Amen.